We are live. Before you start coding, you to exit full screen. Docs.google.com. Really? That's all you see. Oh. You don't see my slides. I cannot see your slides. Okay. Can you go, go back and just share full screen? Yeah, I think I will. Just share full screen. <laughs> and instead of the app application. <laughs> Share entire screen. We. Okay, how about that? Okay. Yes. Maybe I did see it before because maybe it was just so far behind. Yeah. 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 I'll check. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to start in 15 seconds. Okay. Approximately. All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, welcome to my talk. It's called Before You Start Coding, What's Your Digital Strategy? My name is Tristan Chambers. I'm a web developer and a reluctant digital strategist. Um, I say that because I've, had, I've worn many hats on many projects. Um, right now, I'm, I work in a department called uh, Digital Strategies and Services at Smith College in the libraries. Um, and um, just so you know, most of my work has been with nonprofit um, education and cultural heritage institutions on the small to medium size. Um, but I've, I've always been involved with information systems and usually on the web. <clears throat> so um, what is digital strategy? <laughs> That's what we're here to talk about. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to preface this um, by saying that digital strategy is a new term. Um, there are different ideas about what it means, the term. 
Um, there isn't like a, a super like kind of authoritative definition. Um, one thing I will say right off the bat though is that this talk is not about um, a marketing strategy, a digital marketing strategy, which some people use the term digital strategy to refer to. I know nothing about marketing. I can't help you with that. So um, I want to I want to pull the group today. What do you think digital strategy is? Any thoughts come to mind? Cloud or local? The decision about should we go cloud? Should we go local? Yeah, generally tools. Figuring out how what tools are the right tools for the problem you're trying to solve. Right. What tools should we use to solve a problem? Workflow. Maybe. Workflow. What about workflow? Focusing workflow with how whatever the data is, content, how that's going to move through. Right, what is the publishing workflow of content? What are the systems and how do they, how do we use them? Stuff like that. Yeah, <clears throat> those are all good ideas. Um, so I want to start uh, by sharing a story with you. We've all been here, I think, or at least I have. Um, and if you haven't, I, I would be surprised. Um, ha has anyone had this experience where, like, the CEO or the chair of the board, they're like, we need an app, right? <laughs> we need an app. Can we make it this year? Can you make an app, right? Um, it's going to change everything, right? So, um, I mean, you know, should it be on the iPhone? Should it be for Android? Should it be for Windows Phone? Should it work on a tablet? Um, very specific questions. Do we need an app, though? Like, what's the app for? Like, why do we need an app, right? Uh, well, it turns out. It's for people to read our newsletter, right? Which will boost my brand, by the way, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, well, I'm I'm skeptical personally, um, because uh, why why do we need an app for uh, you know for people to read our newsletter? Do people want to read our newsletter, for example? Um, so, uh, and in principle, um, my question here stems from. Um, instead of focusing on the how, we should focus on the why and the what. Two very um, critical distinctions in my mind that we get tripped up with every day, and I do it too. We all do it. So some other uh, you know examples here. We need a microsite, right? Um, and so that uh, you know uh, the fulfillment department can post stuff about their um, their hobbies, and it should have a Twitter feed, definitely. Attached to it, right? Um, we need, you know, or a landing, a whole landing page instead. Maybe we should make a landing page instead of a microsite, right? Um, maybe we should have a podcast. While we're at it, why don't we make it a vlog? We get some high def cameras, uh, Final Cut Pro, you know? Um, but maybe on a more practical note, <clears throat> we need a new CRM because the one we have is looking long in the tooth um, and it's actually really slowing down work. Um, how about a state-of-the-art search engine so that people can search our stuff? Maybe we need a new website because the one we have is actually uh, at the end of its life and uh, will soon be vulnerable to, you know, myriad security vulnerabilities. <clears throat> so, um, how to choose, right? <laughs> Uh, decision makers in our in our organizations, they must be wondering um, if the next digital initiative is money well spent. This stuff is very expensive. You know, these projects cost sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars or fractions of a million dollars. You know, um, I've worked on projects that were you know in the three or four hundred thousand dollar range, and you want to make sure that like when it's done, it actually does something that we want, right? <laughs> that actually like serves the mission of the organization, that makes work better, that like makes our constituents or end users happy. But how do you, um, you know, <clears throat> how does one decide what digital initiatives to take and when? How do we order them? How do we decide what they are? <clears throat> hard questions. This is the hard stuff. Coding is fun, right? At least I do think so. So. Um, and I'll give you a hint. The answer isn't necessarily what the chair of the board th uh, dreamt up, you know, on his uh, on his car ride to uh, the next board meeting, right? It may or may not be. Not necessarily wrong. Not necessarily right. But we can't stop there and just take that uh, at face value with those opinions. <clears throat> 
So, um, I'm reading off paper today because we couldn't get the, the presenter thing to work. Um, so, uh, we need a framework for planning and execution of digital initiatives, a kind of workflow or a process um, that can that can make this a little more sane, uh, that we can all kind of be working off the same, uh, you know, kind of agreed upon uh, principles and systems and coordinate around. <clears throat> and I think we should call that digital strategy. So, uh, basically what we need is a roadmap. How are we going to get from here to there? Um, and I'd like to, I'd like to uh, kind of confine our discussion today because of, you know, we only have 45 minutes to how do we generate a roadmap, for example. There's a lot of other things we can talk about about digital strategy, um, but I'm just going to focus on that today. So, um, <clears throat> a lot of um, a lot of organizations um, basically uh, operate without a plan. They um, um, you know they uh, they respond to the changes uh, just uh, merely on a, a tactical level rather than a strategic level. They're just sort of responding in this knee jerk way. Um, and they, you know, they might blindly adopt the latest trending technology because it seems like a good idea, um, or uh, hurriedly, you know, replace some deprecated system at the last possible moment because they realize it right then that oh, we need to transition. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, in effect, they they basically they can't organize their work in a sane way um, in even a short term span because it seems impossible to plan ahead. Um, and and it's and they're not alone. You know, we all we all face this uncertainty um, because technology changes very quickly, right? That's the the kind of crux of it. Um, so what I propose, and many uh, digital strategists propose, is approaching these questions um, instead of with sort of like fixed rules of thumb, like you should do this, you should definitely not do that. Um, approach it with um, principles basic principles like a constitution that starts with very abstract ideas um, that allows us to evaluate very quickly whether this is the direction we need to go based on the things that we've already agreed on, that we all agree on. So um, <clears throat> I propose adopting some principles here. Um, like I said, it lets us stay flexible instead of using rules. So um, here's my principles for a flexible digital strategy. Mission driven, so does it serve the mission of your organization or your department or particular program that you're working on, you know, whatever. Um, user centered, absolutely critical that your users are the people that you're actually building this stuff for, not the corporate exec. Um, why, not how, which I mentioned before. So let's just forget for a second how exactly we're going to you know, build this app or whatever. Let's talk about why we need to communicate with people about this. You know, what will be, um, what are we gonna get out of that? And let's be specific about that. And, and tied to that is, <clears throat> can we verify that the why actually worked out, right? That like, when we built this app, yeah, people started you know, know, buying more stuff, whatever it is, um, and I should mention that it, it doesn't have to be numerical, it doesn't have to be quantitative, it can be qualitative, but it does have to be empirical. We have to be able to like observe it in reality, right? <laughs> so, and then finally, uh, that we should take small bites while we're doing this. We should not, uh, wherever possible, we should uh, do smaller projects, you know, agile, I'm talking about agile here, not just in scrum cycles, but in the way we plan our technology projects on a bigger scale, we should be taking smaller bites and going through them and reevaluating so that after a year we say, oh, we haven't blown our entire budget on the new website when we also, you know, still need money for the CRM, you know? So, <clears throat> uh, does this sound reasonable? Anybody have anything they'd like to add? Yeah. 
or comments that they'd like to make about that? So in this case, is variable also like just taking a measurement of if you reached your strategy or not, or if it's successful or not? Yeah, I, I use the term verifiable because it's sort of a general term that any any means of verifying, whether it be a measurement, a quantitative measurement, or um, a qualitative measurement, that we can actually like observe that in reality. So, and what would be some, an example of a, of a qualitative measurement? So, would, uh, you, would you set up something before you actually implement the change and then reevaluate re later? Uh, yeah, ideally, you would actually set those goals ahead of time, and you would say, for example, um, that um, users can find, you know, can like find the thing they're looking for, for example, right? Um, and you know, you, you could like make a bell curve and say like 90% of users can find what they're looking for, but we could just say like, yeah, so that users can find what they're looking for, right? That's a goal, right? And if after we be rebuild the search engine, users can't find what they're looking for, we are, we are not successful, right? That's an example. Uh. Uh, um, so I have actually done strategic technology things for a number of years, and one of the important parts is it's an iterative process. It is also the part I have never gotten the CEO to buy into. But when, especially when you're talking the small bites, and then you go back and you begin again because it is, you're never done. Yeah, that's right. right. You're never done. Right. Is another, um, yeah. Principle that I tried without yeah, and um, I was really hoping to spend a lot of our session just talking about like how to deal with the pushback, you know, from management about this stuff. <laughs> but um, I, I'm, it's going to be really tight as is, but we'll see how far we get um, because I think that's an important topic. Yeah. I was just going to say that verifiable helps you to really work on the top three, right? Mm -hmm. Because if if the top three aren't well specified, you won't be able to come up with ways to test that you're going to solve them. Right. So number four is sort of a litmus test for the quality of the work you did on the first three. Yep, that's right. I agree. Yeah, and and you know the first three, I think you can talk to you know an executive about this thing. You know, like does it serve the mission? Do your users, uh, you know, are they served better? Of course, um, you may have to sugarcoat that, put some honey on the rim. Because uh, you know maybe they just don't care about users, um, but you can say, well, it's going to make more money, right? <laughs> if they care about that, I don't know, right? It's going to improve your personal brand. Right? <laughs> it's amazing how. Explanation point. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what our motives are actually are, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit. So I want to <clears throat> really emphasize, like I was saying though, that this is a user-centered strategy much like we would have a user-centered design. You probably heard that buzzword. Um, it's really important. So um, as we step through kind of making this roadmap, uh, we'll be checking in with users a lot in the process. <clears throat> so um, here's an example of what I'm talking about. <laughs> And the way that's, that's, that's a brilliant that is diagram. It's so true. Right? <laughs> and so I'm gonna jump out here and give you the oh. Yeah, not just university. Here's the hover, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do I get out of presenter mode? Okay. Here we go. Okay. So I'd like to share with you a roadmap process. These are the steps, kind of rough steps um, that one can take, that I've taken many times in developing a roadmap. I laid it out in this like pretty diagram, you know. And it makes it look like so easy. It's just you just like, <laughs> and then you're done, right? It's not true, right? So this will help us organize the way we talk about the process. But actually, the process goes in fits and starts. It starts over. It happens in meta cycles. 
it happens, you know, kind of in this like fractalian, bizarre, you know, maze, right? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> what? That was an evil chuckle. Yeah, evil <laughs> chuckle. That was my evil chuckle. I do that a lot. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So what we have here is uh, uh, discover the mission. I know that sounds crazy. I'll explain why. Identify the problems and opportunities, which should be sort of at the core of the things that sort of set off your exploration into uh, what kind of work you might be doing. Solutionizing, finally, after you've actually identified those problems and solutions, instead of starting with the solutions and then coming up with problems to justify making the solutions, right? Um, <clears throat> and then uh, prioritizing, which um, at this point, executive stakeholder is critical, because uh, if you don't have their buy-off and their sign-in, None of this stuff. You're not going to be able to, you know, tell your coworkers like, "Hey, this is what we're doing," right? So, um, and then finally, um, <clears throat> you've got a roadmap, but um, we have to do it a lot, right? We have to lather, rinse, repeat, um, evaluate, and adapt. And I'd say maybe maybe once a year you could make this uh, kind of fold this into your annual process so that you're ahead of the curve, right? So that instead of reacting to the next big thing while you're trying to do the last thing, you can say, well, actually, you know, I've identified these three things that are a big deal and they're on the roadmap for the next two years. Um, uh, so, you know, let's, let's take this all into account um, instead of just, you know, <clears throat> immediately doing the next thing that someone thought was a good idea. <clears throat> so uh, let's talk about mission. So uh, you can go to the about page, right, of your organization or your client's organization, and surely there will be a mission statement there that you can read. And yes, that's very useful. Um, but I think that you should definitely sit down and interview uh, the president, executive director, or directors, whoever uh, the decision maker here is, because they might actually give you a different mission, or maybe one with fuller, uh, more information than you have available to you just by reading that sentence. Um, new information, because things change all the time. There might be things on the horizon that they know about that haven't really shown up in that mission and vision yet. Um, the other thing this does is it, it earns their buy-in. <clears throat> it gets their, um, it makes them feel like they can trust you, like they've played a part in this process, and then they uh, will value the outcomes of this process. They'll value the product of the process, which is absolutely important, like I mentioned. So, um, <clears throat> Next, uh, the really tricky stuff is identifying problems and opportunities, and it's tricky because of this kind of like if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail problem. Where you know, if you you know, the iOS app is the hammer, and every problem can be solved with an iOS app, right? Um, so, <laughs> um, so uh, being a user-centered approach, let's start with our users. Uh, we have staff users, or sort of back-end users, and we have end users using the site. Um, interview them. There is no substitute for an interview. A survey is not good enough. Um, a survey can be a very useful tool as a quantitative assessment once you've got some stuff in your hopper that you want to verify, but it is not, in my opinion, a valuable source in itself. Interviews um, go so much further in sort of uh, stirring up the dust at the bottom that's sort of like been settling there. So. Um, like I said, interview them. Ask them uh, really stupid questions like, um, instead of asking like, uh, so what do you do? Ask them, what's the last thing you did today or yesterday, right? Um, or with using this system, if you're interested in a particular system or have questions about it. Um, and then ask them, yeah, is there anything slowing down your work? Um, and then shadow their work. Say, would you, for me, um, Process another item in your workflow. Let's just step through it step by step. It will take a long time. But while you're doing it, four more things will come up that they forgot to mention when you ask them cold, right? So, um, and then finally, ask them about uh, the customers or clients that they work with um, and find out if, you know, are they having issues? Are they complaining about something? Is there something they love? Is there something they use every day? Is there something they never use or didn't know about, maybe? Um, because these people, a lot of them are on the front line. They're the ones who are actually working with, uh, working with those end users, and they have more information than anyone else in the organization. <clears throat> so uh, on to external users. Those end users, 
um, you want to do a very similar interview process if you can. Uh, if you can get you know approval and, and set those up, um, super valuable. While you're at it, make sure that you get um, uh, allocate some uh, resources for incentives. They can be very small, but they're very important <clears throat> because not only does it encourage people to like participate, but it gives them an incentive to give you like real information while you're doing it. They're more invested in the outcome of that process. And our goal is to find out about their goals. <clears throat> so um, you know, explicit goals, implicit goals. Um, uh, you, you know, you want to use a lot of the same interview techniques, uh, like you know, why do you use our website, for example? Um, what um, would you, you know, show me how you use our website? Things like that. Um, and uh, a, a, a really great example, a survey actually that is great is a one question survey. What did you come here for today? Right on your homepage. Um, really powerful uh, data points there. So, um, and then um, ask them while you have their attention for their frank opinions about your products, whether they're current products or new products that you intend to build. And that could give you some valuable insight. Ask them, would you use this? Is this what you want? Uh, if not, what do you think? You may learn some really interesting things that you or no one else in your organization had thought of that could be real, real uh, sleepers. So, um, and I should say, I'm talking a lot about products, um, and I like to think in products, um, even though I don't work in business where we sell things. Um, I work in cultural heritage, I work in nonprofits. But a lot of the things we do are digital products. So just because you're not in a business doesn't mean that this stuff doesn't apply to you. I just wanted to mention that. <clears throat> so, uh, and then also, um, you know, go back to your executive stakeholders or during that initial interview. Um, find out what they're thinking of. You know, find out uh, what are the challenges that they see in the near future. Um, what problems do they see? What uh, opportunities do they see? Um, it's a good opportunity. They know things that nobody else knows. They're on the, the front line there, so uh, make sure that that's in the hopper. So um, finally, it's also a good idea to research outside threats and opportunities that are not sort of within your organization or your users. This could be something like um, an end-of-life warning about an off-the-shelf tool that you are using or technology. Um, new technologies that are being developed that could really change the way you do your work. Could be social phenomena, you know, uh, things, you know, taste changes and can have a huge effect. Um, you can't always predict that, but keep your eye out for it. So <clears throat> while you're doing this, um, you can and should use analytics to, um, you know, mine analytics that you have to identify problems. You know, is there like a huge dropout at your donation page? Duh, we should fix that, right? So, you know, maybe nobody actually looked at that. <clears throat> um, and, and also, I should mention, uh, invariably, while you're doing these interviews and looking for problems, solutions will be suggested by, you know, your interviewees, even by yourself and your own mind, your creative mind will, will chime in and say, ah, oh, we can do this. Write all those things down and make sure that those people uh, feel heard uh, and like their, their idea is valued. Um, and some of it may uh, uh, be fruitful. Uh, and, but like I said, we're not going to stop there, um, but do record them. So um, finally, another really low cost, easy thing you can do is rehearse the user experience <clears throat> as a, a, you can role play as an end user. And start, you know, for example, just from a blank screen all the way through Google search through a transaction or whatever it is that um, you see at the end of the, those goals. And I'll caution you, though, again, um, this isn't a replacement for an interview because you can only test the things that you know about, right? You can only test the goals that you know about. Right? It's limited to your own imagination. Um, oh, I have so many things to say. You also want to explore the problems behind the problems, right? So if someone says, for example, I can't print this form on this, this database. I just want to print the form. You don't blindly just say, like, oh, OK, that's a thing we need to do, right? No, because we're going to ask why, right? So that I can give it to the other department so they can do data entry into their system, right? 
we have like a manual process now that could have been done by like a synchronization system, an API call, right? So ask, uh, dig deeper. Or for example, um, I can't paste a link in my post. Well, why do you want to paste a link? So that um, I can paste a link to a file that I uploaded to Imager so that I can share a picture of a cat with my friend. Right? Maybe we should just have an image attachment feature instead of link sharing. Right? So um, that's where the, if you've ever done user stories, I want dot, 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 so that, dot, 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 that, so that becomes a very important tool in your, uh, in your problematizing. Finally, while you're doing all this assessment, um, there are some opportunities here that are lurking that nobody knows about, and that is your own assets that people thought um, are worthless. So um, that search that um, the executives think that nobody uses because it's so crappy, but it turns out, well, actually, everybody's using the search, and we need to invest in that. And you know, it's a little janky, but uh, we could just put a little effort into this and have you know a really successful product. Okay, so um, time for the fun stuff: solutions. So this is where we get to go crazy and talk about you know we're gonna have like a you know whatever it is we're gonna have you know a Drupal-based solution. We're gonna have an iPhone app. We're gonna have you know a Ruby on Rails app. We're gonna have. A, PostgreSQL database that's running a GIS stack and you know whatever. So, um, <clears throat> but before we get too crazy, um, we have an obligation to explore the stupidly simple non-technical solutions that could solve these problems. Maybe the simplest thing is actually the best thing, um, and it could be. Um, could be non-technical, could be trivial, right? It could be an email attachment. Maybe it's the case that, you know, uh, in the previous example where someone said, well, I want to print this page to give it to this other department so they can do data entry in their system. How often does that happen? If it only happens two times a year, you don't need to build a, a synchronization system for that, right? That wouldn't be worth the effort of, uh, you know, putting in dev time on that. So also in tandem with this, don't forget the do nothing option, which I know can sound totally crazy. But don't forget to remind yourself and everyone you're working with that do nothing is an option, and you should weigh the cost and benefit of doing nothing. Because <clears throat> surprisingly, it can actually be the best option, believe it or not. So um, and then also, while we're economizing, let's not forget off-the-shelf solutions. Right? <clears throat> and um, I hate off-the-shelf solutions because they're no fun, right? You don't get to code them. They're not exactly how you want them. There's always some part of it that doesn't work for you exactly how you want, but um, they save you tons and tons of time and money, and it would be stupid not to use them. So while you're doing this, though, while you're evalu evaluating off-the-shelf solutions, you have to be clear, because it's never going to do exactly what you want, you have to be clear about what your requirements are. So go back to those users and get really clear about, is this something that's necessary or something that you would like? Is it a must or a could, right? Um, so that you can actually evaluate whether that off-the-shelf tool is going to fit the, fit the needs. Um, because if they say, yeah, oh yeah, it definitely has to you know, allow a Twitter feed, and then you realize that um, it wasn't actually definitely, it was like, yeah, that would be cool, right? So we should have uh, considered that option after all. Um, one really helpful tool for this, by the way, is called a feature matrix, which is a spreadsheet. At the top is like the products, and then on the side is the features that you know you need, um, you know, whatever they need. And then you put an X where they meet up. And that, that's a very helpful tool. It's hard to keep all that stuff in your brain. A feature matrix. Yeah. Check it out. Just Google it. <clears throat> Hopefully something will come up. So I would rather than put an X. Um, I use a score, so you actually yeah. have a numerical score. You can right? use a score. That's like right. A zero doesn't have one eh, minimal. That's right. Yeah, you can use a score. Or and three exceptional, that kind of thing. So the highest yep. score makes it easier for people to make right. decisions. It does. Um, yeah, you can use a score, and you can even um, do a coefficient on the score of that thing. So you can say like, the Twitter feed is like not very important. 
this thing mostly supports Twitter feeds, but since it's not that important, it ends up only being an 0.1 in your total score, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, so you can get... also find, if you're working with different departments, what's really important. So, for example, I worked a lot in the medical, and it was imperative for nursing that the printer work. Whereas uh, the admin, who cares about the printer? If right. it's down, they'll just go down the hall. So her functionality, you, the weight is different <clears throat> as well. Right, so it depends on your stakeholders and where they're coming yeah. from, what the, what the, the criticality of those things are. Get yeah. So, um, yeah, lots to do with this um, solutionizing, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop there. Um, but I, I, I assume that that's giving you an idea of what we're talking about. So, um, just really quickly, uh, while we're doing this, we need to be clear about what the goals are of these solutions. Um, what are they actually going to fix? Um, what effects will they have? That's going to help us to evaluate later. And we also need to know what their costs will be. And that's, again, where you need to bring in your technology stakeholders, your technology partners, or your in-house technology to figure out the complexity of these projects. Um, and I like to use the word complexity. It's a more generic term instead of like dollars or hours. Um, <clears throat> but whatever you use, you have to keep it kind of consistent so that you can weigh things later. So uh, now we have like a huge list of stuff basically now, right? With like, you know, lots of ideas about what they might be, what their costs might be, uh, what their impacts might be. And now when we prioritize, it's going to be like relatively easy because we've done all that work to figure out what this stuff is and we can actually weigh them and, and sort them. So uh, <clears throat> obviously, I hope what we want to do. Like imagining that we have a little graph here, and in our uh, in our y-axis, is this the y-axis? Yeah. No, this is the x. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in our x-axis is effort, right? Really hard all the way down, really easy way at the beginning, and then in our y-axis we have impact. Impact at the top, no impact at the bottom. I hope it's obvious that the things we want to do are on the top left corner of that graph. You don't literally have to make a graph, but just as an illustration. And the things at the bottom right corner of your graph, you probably don't want to do those, right? Just like, don't do them. The stuff in the top right corner, don't do them right now. Wait until you invest in those things. Start with the things in the top left corner that are big bang for your buck. Um, <clears throat> that's often the case. So um, in other words, start small with things that will give you big wins. Um, and, and this is good for all kinds of reasons, um, because, because our, our, uh, the, the horizon is so near, we don't know what's going to happen. If we invest in a huge thing, by the time it's done, we might be in another place where this is no longer relevant. So we have to be really careful about taking on projects that are too big. Because also, they're always three times bigger than you thought that they were, right? At least. <clears throat> so um, it's really critical also, while you're doing this, that um, that your executives are at the table while these decisions are being made. They're the ones who are going to have the final sign-off on this, um, and they need to be involved with the process, again, so they have ownership, so that the rest of the people in your organization take it seriously because they endorse it. <clears throat> um, a really helpful tool to use with them is the Moscow prioritization uh, system, MSCW. MSCW, also known as Moscow. Uh, must, that means we got to do it. Should, we probably should do that. Could, we could do that if we had the time and won't. We're not going to do that. Uh, or we could do that like some other time, but forget about it, right? <clears throat> really helpful. Just put it in your spreadsheet, make it a column, sort by Moscow, done. So um, also, you know, uh, 
that's just an order. It's not in time, right? I think that's really important because it keeps you flexible. We're not making too many pretensions about what's going to happen when. We're just saying this is the order that things have to happen in their importance. And I think that that's really important because if we get too crazy with when exactly things are going to happen, we're going to end up with a train wreck <clears throat> when the first thing takes three times as long as we thought it would, right? Which always happens. So um, uh, it, it is, of course, important to consider, you know, while you're doing this, maybe some external dates, you know, that could like affect your activities and just sort of like flag them and know that those are part of, you know, your planning. And you can revisit this roadmap and think about the specifics of when things are going to happen on a much more frequent basis um, while you're executing this stuff, to think about that timeline. Um, so you got a roadmap. Yay! So um, obviously, though, it's not done, right? I would regard this as a living document, as something that's always changing. And um, it should, this is a process that, like I said at the beginning, you should probably be doing on the regular so that you can stay ahead of the, the emergent things that are happening always. Um, and using our principles, we can evaluate and adapt our plan uh, regularly. <clears throat> so um, how are we doing? I've got. How, when do we have to stop? One. Oh, good. Um, the next one starts at 11. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Two okay. Before 11 yeah, okay. So we got 15 minutes, let's say. Oh, I did so good. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried that I was going to be like halfway through and like it would be, I'd be out of time. So, okay. So um, let's talk about. Um, any, well, any questions about that? Question about yeah. that. When you say about once a year, but you say initially mm -hmm. when you're first, the first time that you do it, you, you, you don't do it and then wait a year. You actually go back and re, re go through this process at, at a sooner. Okay, yeah. So um, when I was, I was talking about timelines and how you'll want to revisit kind of how your roadmap maps on to your timeline very frequently, like monthly. Probably, you know, some, or even weekly, depending. <laughs> um, you know, using the roadmap as a guide, you can think about timelines in the near future in this kind of agile methodology where you're saying, like, yeah, probably monthly, you know, uh, things can become irrelevant very quickly, um, but also things can take longer than you thought they would very quickly. Um, so that can really affect your timeline. So um, what I was suggesting is that this kind of big cycle of like evaluation, kind of problem and uh, opportunity discovering and prioritization, that can happen in a yearly process, say, or really whatever fits you, but I, I'd say years. You probably couldn't do it faster than eight, once a year, because it, um, it is a lot of work, by the way, to do this. Um, and uh, <clears throat> But then once you have that roadmap, um, in terms of actual timeline, like what's happening in the next three months, you'll need to revisit that very frequently, right? Yeah. So one thing about doing this in small bites and iteratively is you don't have a big reveal. So like your team isn't acknowledged that your team, which is very often cost-centered to the, the place you're working, right? You're not making money for them. You're creating the environment in which they make money. Um, without a big reveal, how do you get recognition for your value? So is, I mean, because that's a good question. How do you change in the dynamic of? Yeah, so the question is, how do you get recognition for the value of this work? Yeah. How do you get that acknowledged? Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. I don't have a good answer for you. I can tell you, while doing this work, we've had many wins. Um, and I do like to brag about them. And so, whom do you brag? When you're uh, usually my boss. But, <laughs> but, um, Sometimes, you know, my boss will mention them, you know, to, to the group and say, like, you know, we figured out that um, if we went this way, um, you know, that would have wasted a ton of money and we're happy that we didn't, you know, something like that. So um, I think that's where you're verifiable. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
where if you can verify that the goals you set out were met, that shows the value. And you make sure to, to push it out out. because well, that's a big reveal, right? If you're building this gigantic Mongo website, even if it doesn't do what you want it to do, it's this palpable thing that everybody can do. Look how much work that was. Right, right? so two, two points uh, out in the group. One is, um, if you, if you stay verifiable, you can demonstrate the value of these initiatives. But it's hard to, to compete with kind of the flashy, uh, uh, tangible new website launch, right? That makes everybody go, ooh, ah, right? Where this is the future, right? Um, those are good questions. Um, yeah, it's really not sexy, this stuff that we're talking about. Nobody wants to do this. And by the way, um, some, some things I, you know, I, I like to talk about is <clears throat> um, why are you doing this? You might be asking yourself that. Is this my in my job description, right? So like I'm a developer, but I do this, right? Because nobody else is doing it, right? There's nobody else in the organizations that I've worked for who have had this in this in their job description or had the skills to do it. Is so. That's why I'm the reluctant digital strategist. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but as the someone, the person who has to build this stuff, I have a, I have an interest in making sure that those projects are successful, that my that I do good work, and that it has a good effect, right? So, um, you have to be bold about this stuff um, and take initiative, um, because, like I said, um, it's very likely that no one else will do this, and this is like a an endemic problem. In technology right now, and most you know, it's recognized by most uh, most people in the industry, um, and digital strategists bemoan this problem. Um, it's not valued, this work right now. Um, it's not priority. I'm really lucky because I now my new job. I work in the Department of Digital Strategies and Services, and we really care about this stuff. So it's cool. Yeah. So, so I understand. So I think your question. About reveal is that you're trying to keep morale of the team up, right? Right, and 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 I think this is actually when you're iterating like that, it, it's harder to make reveals. I found uh, it, it, to, to make basically internal demos is kind of like the reveal, and because you need to push this. Okay, now we built this little feature. Now you know, in the next <coughs> two weeks from now, there's another feature. Not everybody's gonna come to this thing, but the stake, the people who are working on it, they will be on the all these demos. And then a bunch of other people who are interested in certain things, you know, it's shoot the email, it's got the information, people show up on your web demos and move on. And uh, that, that's my experience. Yeah. Do you do those virtually or do you do those in person? Like you get but people in the office? Well, because we're companies with spread out. So. Another, um, so uh, one of the comments was uh, do, do reveals every time you develop a new feature. So if you're working in a more like agile feature development process, um, or you know, you can do reveals when you work on these smaller projects and they have real impact. Um, and certainly um, you can do that. Uh, the other thing that I should mention is that while you're doing this solutionizing, you want to check back in with your stakeholders and verify that the solution you've come up with actually serves their needs and walk them through it. You can do a paper prototype, for example. Very simple things, just like draw out, like this is what it's going to look like. And that'll probably make their day. Excited about their lives being easier um, or, or the difference that you're making for the people that they work with every day. Um, over here. So this is all about saving money, and time is money, obviously. And uh, you don't want to run off or, you know, haphazard because of a shiny object. What gets us time and time again is the, the fact that we, we all we're doing is planning about stuff that we want, where, where um, the company is throwing stuff on the table for us and running away, like marketing especially. Okay, do it. And what sets us back quite a bit, because we're very small, is that we spend all this time thinking, uh, discussing, and uh, putting dates to things, and it takes so long for you to get back to it because there's all these other stuff that you haven't finished yet. And it's like their eyes are bigger than their the other way around. Or their, you know, no, that's I mean? right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's like but we don't have the time to support it. And then when I finally get back to what this project was, I've lost a sense of familiarity or people forget that's what they decided upon. So how do you rein, how do you rein people in 
in this model? Like, do you, right. do you put a deadline or a, a, when do you start, when do you expect to finish, and these external projects? That's that's the, the main thing, these external projects. So the question, let me make sure I've got it, is um, when you're doing this kind of strategizing, uh, how do you deal with the kind of like overwhelming like river of requests uh, from say a marketing department for example um, and like keep your own workload down and sort of like manage that and also kind of keep track of those projects that you have committed to uh, and, and keep them um, keep them sane um, speaking for myself I would say that documentation is critical so um, <clears throat> I really wanted to present about this, which is like a whole other thing, which is how do you produce successful digital product, right? Um, it's a whole black art in itself. Um, and some things I'll mention is that, you know, if, for example, as we all do, if you're forgetting, like, what it is that we were even going to deliver, uh, I really recommend using charters for a new project, a project charter. Uh, will identify, for example, the, the product vision, sort of like what's it supposed to do, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the audience that it serves, the, um, uh, the sponsor, you know, who's asking for it, um, and who's working on it, <clears throat> who's responsible for maintaining it when it's done, both in terms of content as well as um, maintenance, you know, security, new features, so on and so forth. Um, a project charter can um, also, <laughs> I guess, deter people from asking you to do like 40 million things because they have to first do a charter with you, right? <laughs> a, little, a little, a minor barrier. I don't know, it could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on, you know, how things are going in your, your own dynamics at work. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of charters. And then, of course, while you're doing that, um, you should talk about features and uh, you know what special technology, technological you know sort of machinations are involved with that project in that charter. Um, so um, <clears throat> that's one thing that can really ground the work. Um, and you can go back to that charter and say, well, you know that and you know timeline is often on a charter too. You know when does it need to be done by? Uh, you can say, well, these are the parameters of the project that we agreed on, you know, six months ago when we decided to do this thing. Um, and we have delivered on the main, you know, points that we agreed on. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I find really useful. The other thing is, um, like I was talking about the feature matrix about, you know, off-the-shelf tools, getting really clear about <clears throat> the features and functionality that will be developed. So uh, basically, the requirements process as we call it, um, is really critical. So um, make a list of the features that will be developed. <clears throat> and of course, just like everything else, you want that to be a user-driven process. Um, don't agree to, do, to add a feature to a product if it doesn't have uh, an attached user story or user goal. Right? That'll, that'll really you know, help keep things sane. And by the way, users, uh, you know, user goals are not just for end users. They can be for your staff, too, right? Mm -hmm. So like marketing wants to reach end users to sell more stuff, right? They want to put ads in front of people so that they click the link so that they buy the stuff. And that's, that's a user story, right? Mm -hmm. So. Do you have other stuff on? Uh, have you done some of these uh, workshops elsewhere that we could? Uh, time to do this. Not really on the. I, I have a terrible web footprint. I just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it seems like you know you have a really interesting outline of like a set of documents, like a packet that somebody could use to cr to create to follow this process. Yeah, and so these slides, of course, will be available uh, somehow. Does anybody know how? Uh, anyway. <laughs> I'm sure there's a place for the slides, right? I mean, right? Yeah, the slides, right? Like when you talked about what what were the elements of the interview, you know? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. I would love to be able to sort of pick up a package that says, right. you know, do some interviews, and these are the things to be sure to do. Ask right. them to do the task, you know. Ask so, this question. Ask that question. So, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Right? Yeah, you could you could make a zillion dollars. So e book. I'll write a book. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> 
that's a confidence booster. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can I can make these available. My boss has asked me. Speaking of getting by, my boss has asked me to give this presentation at work. So, oh, great. Um, that's great. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we've got like one more question or comment or. Well, just um, I I'm actually a community organizer. Uh, here in Massachusetts, you have one of the world's best uh, strategists in the world, uh, Gene Sharp. If you're not familiar with his work and you want to read more about strategy and the different levels cool. of strategy and things like that, um, I highly recommend. He's pretty much unknown in this country, which is a surprise because he's translated into 30 languages and well-known abroad. But so, he's, a, he's a huge resource on strategy. So uh, the name is Gene Sharp. Gene Sharp. Big, big deal strategist. He's actually in the area. And how do you spell his name? Uh, G E N E S A S A R P, I believe. He wrote uh, from Dictatorship to Democracy. Uh, G E N E S H A R P, yeah. and he wrote Dictatorship from, from Dictatorship to Democracy. From Dictatorship to Democracy. <laughs> cool. It's apropos to today's world. I yeah, think. we're going to reverse it, right? <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. So that was excellent. I really Thank enjoyed you. it. I'm going to stop the recording okay. so we can have, you know, so that you're yeah. not being streamed on the Good internet. Stuff. There we go.